I'm Adam, and this is chapter two of What is Sex by Alinka Zipinchic. And even stranger out there. The quandary of the relation. Let us return to John Huston's movie Freud, The Secret Passion. The remark of the chairman, trying to restore order in the passionate outrage provoked by Freud's lecture on infantile sexuality. Gentlemen, we are not in a political meeting does indeed point us in a most interesting direction, that of a surprising coincidence between politics and the Freudian theory of sexuality. It is as if every time one reopens the question of sexuality, something is decided that is of a political order. This certainly held true for the politics of the psychoanalytic movement itself and for the ruptures it produced within the movement, but it might also be true in the more specific sense of politics as referring to what can be articulated around some fundamental social antagonisms. When speaking about psychoanalysis and politics today, one usually adopts one of two attitudes. The first is to leave sexuality out, put it aside, and pursue other concepts such as the barred other, surplus enjoyment, the Lacanian theory of the four discourses, the Lacanian contribution to the ideology critique. All of these are, of course, crucial, yet they cannot be exempted from the issue of the sexual without losing something central, namely, a conceptual articulation of a negativity at work at their core, sustaining them as well as relating them to one another. There is also a second attitude which, in tune with the prevailing Western ideology of our time, combines moral liberalism, anything goes, and should be tolerated, as long as there is no abuse involved, with political conservatism of the status quo, in which every zealous political engagement is by definition pathological, unbefitting to normal, non-neurotic human beings. These two attitudes share a symmetrical, albeit not identical, mistake. The philosophical and politically more radical reading of Lacan dismisses sexuality as something that has only a secondary, anecdotal, or regional relevance. And the liberal psychoanalytic reading dismisses politics as something that is necessarily pathological, blind to the impossibility at work in it. The mistake of the first reading is not that it misunderstands the relevance of sexuality, but that it considers it as something something which simply is, and can be deemed of lesser or greater importance. In the same way, the mistake of the second reading is not that it fails to see that an essentially different politics is nevertheless possible, but again that it takes politics as something, as a fully-fledged entity within certain characteristics. In other words, it fails to see that politics is by definition the politics of the impossible relation. What relates sexuality to politics is that they are not simple ontological categories, but essentially imply, depend on, and deploy something which is not on the order of being, and which Lacan refers to as the real. The real is precisely not being, but its inherent impasse. The Lacanian concept of the sexual is not one that provides the best description so far of a certain reality called sexuality. What it does is develop a unique model of thinking, a fundamental non-relationship, as dictating the conditions of different kinds of ties, including social ties or discourses. For this is what the Lacanian concept of sexuality is primarily about. It conceptualizes the way in which a fundamental impasse of being is at work in its structuring as being. It is important, however, to stress the following. By insisting that the Lacanian concept of the sexual is not simply about any kind of sexual content or sexual practice, we are in no way aiming at its purification, trying to produce something like its pure form or pure philosophical idea, and hence making it philosophically more acceptable. The point is that beyond all sexual content and practices, the sexual is not a pure form, but refers instead to the absence of this form as that which curves and defines the space of the sexual. In other words, this is an absence or a negativity that has important consequences for the field structured around it. How do we understand this? The paradoxical status of sex is the opposite of, say, the status of unicorns. 
It is not about an entity that is nowhere to be found empirically, although we know exactly what it would look like if it were found empirically. Rather the opposite. Empirically, there is no doubt that sex exists, and we are pretty well able to recognize, identify it. What seems to be missing, to put this in platonic terms, is the idea of sex, its essence. What exactly do we recognize when we say, this is sex? Plato went so far as to say that even the lowest things, like mud and dirt, have their corresponding ideas, ideal essences. But what about sex? Is there an idea, a pure form, of sex? The answer seems to be negative, and this is not because sex would be situated even lower on the chain of being than mud or dirt, but for some other reason. Presenting sex as low and dirty is already a response, a solution to its more fundamental scandal. Namely, that we don't even know what it is. I have already insisted on this point. The embarrassment and covering up of sexuality as well as its controlling and regulating should not be taken as self-explanatory, that is, as explained by the traditional cultural ban on sexuality, but rather the other way around. This ban should be explained by an ontological lapse involved in the sexual as sexual. The cause of embarrassment in sexuality is not simply something which is there, on display in it, but on the contrary, something that is not there, something which, if it existed, would determine what sex actually is, and name what is sexual about sex. Sex is all around, but we don't even know what exactly it is. We could perhaps go so far as to say when, in the human realm, we come across something and have absolutely no clue what it is, we can be pretty sure that it has to do with sex. This formula is not meant to be ironic. There is sex only in something that does not work. In this precise sense, culture is not simply a mask veil of the sexual. It is the mask, or rather a stand-in for something in the sexual which is not. And it is also, in this precise, indirect sense, that culture, civilization, is, as the classical Freudian stance goes, sexually driven, motivated. It is not driven by that in the sexual which is, but rather by that which is not. That in the sexual which is not is the relation. There is no sexual relation. This famous Lacanian claim is often understood too hastily as a learned and clever-sounding formulation of something that people, poems, literature, films, have always known and kept repeating in different ways. Lasting true love is impossible. Love is mostly unhappy. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Relationships don't work. There are only series of missed encounters. There are only atomized particles. It is easy to show where this kind of understanding moves too quickly and overrides, covers up the real expressed by Lacan's formula. What it does is immediately move to ontologize the non-relationship. And so we exclaim, but of course there is no sexual relationship. This explains it all, and especially the history of our love life. The fundamental ontological category, being as being, is the non-relation, and this is why we are where we are. In this way, the non-relation is thus, wrongly, understood as the ultimate truth, the ultimate code or formula of reality. This truth is admittedly not very pleasant, but that is how it is, and at least we can understand why things are as they are. And it seems to make a lot of sense, compared to, for example, the formula produced by the super-powerful computer in Douglas Adams' famous novel The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. After thousands and thousands of years of processing the question, what is the meaning of life, the computer finally comes up with the answer, which is 42. So, compared with this, Lacan's formula is literally bursting with sense, or, more precisely, with the capacity to make sense of our miseries. In this understanding, we are thus led to conclude that the non-relation is the cause of the oddities and difficulties within all concrete relationships. More precisely, the ontologically stated non-relation is seen in this perspective as the obstacle to the formation of any successful, concrete, empirical relationship. Lacan's point, however, is paradoxically almost the opposite. 
It is only the inexistence of the relation that opens up the space for relationships and ties as we know them. In Lacan's own words, the absence of the relation does, of course, not prevent the tie, la liaison. Far from it, it dictates its conditions. The non-relation gives, dictates the conditions of, what ties us, which is to say that it is not a simple indifferent absence, but an absence that curves and determines the structure with which it appears. The non-relation is not the opposite of the relationship. It is the inherent illogic, the fundamental antagonism of the relationships that are possible and existing. This represents a new and original conceptual model of the discursive space as generated out of and around a missing link in the ontological chain of its own reality. Biased by its constitutive negativity, this structure is always more or less than what it is, that is to say, more or less than the sum of its elements. Moreover, the causal link between these signifying elements is determined by what appears at the place of this negativity as both heterogeneous to and inseparable from the signifying order. The impossible substance of enjoyment conceptualized by Lacan in terms of the partial object A. Object A is not a sexual object. Rather, it is A sexual. It is the objective counterpart of the non-relation. We could say that it is non-relation as object. Yet, it is also what is at work in all forming of ties, in the very structuring of the discursive, being, qua, being. With this in mind, it is more than a pun, a play on words, to suggest that what follows from this Lacanian conceptualization is an object-disoriented ontology. If there is an ontology that follows from psychoanalytic Lacanian theory, it can only be an ontology as disoriented by what he calls the object awe. So again, what is most valuable in the Freudo-Lacanian concept of sexuality is that it introduces a conceptual model of thinking, the non-relation as dictating the conditions of different kinds of ties, including social ties or discourses. In this precise sense, one could reaffirm the well-known slogan, the sexual is political, and give it a new, more radical meaning. The sexual is political, not in the sense of sexuality as a realm of being where political struggles also take place, but in the sense that a true emancipatory politics can be thought only on the ground of an object-disoriented ontology, as sketched above. That is, an ontology that pursues not simply being qua being, but the crack, the real, the antagonism, that haunts being from within and forms it. And what follows... I will develop this with reference to an example which will help us explore and articulate more closely what is at stake in these claims. The example is that of a most peculiar encounter between sexuality and politics as staged in an ingenious text by the Russian Marxist author Andrei Platonov, the Anti-Sexist, situated at the very heart of the 20th century's discussions of a possible emancipatory politics. The Anti-Sexist In his introduction to the recent English re-publication of Andrei Platonov's The Anti-Sexist, Aaron Schuster made the following observation. And this is a block quote. If part of the 20th century's revolutionary program to create a radically new social relation and a new man was the liberation of sexuality... This aspiration was marked by a fundamental ambiguity. Is it sexuality that is to be liberated, delivered from moral prejudices and legal prohibitions, so that the drives are allowed a more open and fluid expression, or is humanity to be liberated from sexuality, finally freed from its obscure dependencies and tyrannical constraints? Will the revolution bring in the efflorescence of libidinal energy, or, seeing it as a dangerous distraction to the arduous task of building a new world, demand its suppression? In a word, is sexuality the object of, or the obstacle to, emancipation? That is the end of the block quote. Schuster is quite right to suggest that this may be a mistaken alternative in the sense that it misses something crucial about the psychoanalytic take on sexuality as well as, we might add, about its take on emancipation. 
whereas emancipation is most often conceived in terms of freeing ourselves from the social non-relation, or as approaching the ideal of the relation, even if it is unattainable. Lacan presents us with a very different perspective. The aim to abolish the non-relation, and to replace it with a relation, is rather the trademark of all social repression. Sexual difference and the oppression of women are very good examples of this. The most oppressive societies have always been those which axiomatically proclaimed, enforced, the existence of the sexual relation. A harmonious relation presupposes an exact definition of essences involved in this relation, and of rules pertaining to them. If there is to be a relation, women need to be such and such. A woman who doesn't know her place is a menace to the image of the relation, as a totality of two elements that complement each other, for example, or as any other kind of cosmic order. To this, psychoanalysis does not respond by saying that woman is in fact something other than what these oppressive orders make her out to be, but with a very different and much more powerful claim. Woman does not exist. We shall return to this later on in our discussion of the sexual difference or divide. If we look at the history of political and class oppression, we can also see how the enforced idea of a harmonious system or social organism has always been accompanied by the most brutal forms of exclusion and oppression. The Lacanian point, however, is not simply something like, let's acknowledge the impossible, the non-relation, and instead of trying to force it, rather put up with it. This indeed is the official ideology of the contemporary secular form of social order and domination, which has abandoned the idea of a harmonious totality to the advantage of the idea of a non-totalizable multiplicity of singularities forming a democratic network. In this sense, it may even seem that the non-relation is the dominant ideology of capitalist democracies. We are all conceived as more or less precious, singularities, elementary particles, trying to make our voices heard in a complex, non-totalizable social network. There is no predetermined social relation. Everything is negotiable, depending on us and on concrete circumstances. This, however, is very different from what Lacan's non-relation claim aims at. Namely, the acknowledged absence of the relation does not leave us with a pure pluralistic neutrality of social being. This kind of acknowledging of the non-relation does not really acknowledge it. What the Lacanian non-relation means is precisely that there is no neutrality of social being. At its most fundamental level, social being is already biased. The non-relation is not a simple absence of relation, but refers to a constitutive curving or bias of the discursive space. The latter is biased by the missing element of the relation. In this sense, to conceive democracy, for example, as a more or less successful negotiation between elements of a fundamentally neutral social being is to overlook, indeed, to repress this consequential negativity operative at the very core of the social order. It is, in fact, just another form of the narrative of the relation, which becomes quite clear if we think about how the political and economic ontology of the non-totalizable multiplicity of neutral singularities is usually accompanied by the idea of some kind of self-regulation. The invisible hand of the market is the showcase example of this. For Lacan, the non-relation does not mean that there is no fixed, predetermined relation between particular elements, but refers to a declination, a twist, in these elements themselves. In themselves, these elements already bear the mark of the non-relation, and this mark is the surplus enjoyment adhering to them. Acknowledging the non-relation does not mean accepting the impossible as something that cannot be done. But seeing how it adheres to all things possible, how it informs them what kind of antagonism it perpetuates in each concrete case, and how. This is the kind of acknowledgement that, far from closing it, only opens up the space of political invention and intervention. 
but let us return to the anti-sexus and how it can help us see and define the core of the problem. So what is this text? To sum it up, I will rely once more on Schuster's presentation. And this is a quite long block quote. In 1926, Russian Marxist author Andrei Platonov composed the Anti-Sexus, a remarkable text which remained, like so many of his other writings, unpublished during his lifetime. The work is a fictional brochure issued by the company Berkman, Chatelois, and Son Limited, and translated from French by Platonov, that advertised an electromagnetic instrument promising to relieve sexual urges in an efficient and hygienic manner. The device, available in both female and male models, had a special regulator for the duration of pleasure and could be fitted for either personal or collective use. The purported occasion for the pamphlet was the company's expansion into the Soviet market after its success in many other parts of the world. The brochure includes a statement touting the virtues of the anti-sexist and the company's mission to abolish the sexual savagery of mankind, and is followed by testimonials by a number of illustrious figures, from Henry Ford to Oswald Spengler to Gandhi and Mussolini. The anti-sexist, we are told, has many benefits and applications. It is perfect for maintaining soldiers' morale during wartime, for improving the efficiency of factory workers, for taming restless natives in the colonies. It also fosters true friendship and human understanding by taking sexual folly out of the social equation. The translator has added a critical preface where he condemns the cynicism and vulgarity of the enterprise even while praising the pamphlet's writerly merits. He explains that the reason he decided to publish the text was to openly reveal the bourgeoisie's moral bankruptcy. No Bolshevik can read this capitalist drivel without a hearty laugh. The anti-sexist thus advertises itself as the surest form of contra-anti-sexual agitprop. And that is the end of the hilarious block quote. We will not go into the very interesting question of where Platonov stands in this debate, staged as it is by him in a multi-layered and multi-genre way, in which a text of literary fiction is presented as a translation of an advertising pamphlet accompanied by comments by prominent men, yes, they are all men, and a critical introduction from the alleged translator. We will simply take the text at face value, and start by interrogating the presuppositions and paradoxes of the device, called the anti-sexist, advertised and discussed in the alleged pamphlet. These are the presuppositions of the anti-sexist device. Sexuality is problematic because it involves the other, who, as everybody knows, is utterly unpredictable, unreliable, has her own will, caprices, indispositions, or simply unavailable. On the other hand, and at the same time, our relations with others are complicated and conflict ridden because expectations and demands concerning sex are always in the air, complicating things. Sex stands in the way of good social relations. This is the double quandary presumably resolved by the anti-sexist device, which is claimed to be able to isolate, extirpate what is sexual about enjoyment from all other pleasures and relations in which it appears to distillate, as it were, the pure essence of sex and then administer it in just the right dosages. In this way, the anti-sexist provides an other-free enjoyment, enjoyment free of the other, and at the same time makes it possible for us to relate to others in a really meaningful way, to create real, lasting bonds, pure spiritual friendship. It is clear that two operations are at stake here, or two aims, on the one hand, the aim is to extract sex from the other. On the other hand, it is to exempt the other from sex. In this way, we get two separate entities. As a result of the first operation, we get a sexless other, to whom we can now relate in a friendly and non-problematic way. As a result of the second operation, we get a pure substance of sex, which we can enjoy directly whenever we want to. The anti sexist is said to accomplish both things. This is another block quote. We have been called upon to solve the global human problem of sex and the soul. 
Our company has transformed sexual feeling from a crude, elemental urge to an ennobling mechanism. We have given the world moral behavior. We have removed the element of sex from the human relationships and cleared the way for pure spiritual friendship. Still, keeping in mind the high value, instant pleasure that necessarily accompanies contact of the sexes, we have endowed our instrument with a construction affording a minimum of three times this pleasure, as compared to the loveliest of women used at length by a prisoner recently released after ten years in strict isolation. It's the end of that lurid block quote. As much as can be tempted to laugh here, this addresses a problem that has been all but constantly raised in modern debates concerning the possible and radical emancipation of humankind. The crucial obstacle to global human emancipation is humanity, human nature itself. Human emancipation is actually emancipation from the human. Human nature is the weak link in the project of social emancipation. In this line of thought, we usually get a harder and a softer mode of resolving the dilemma, either to build a new man or to canalize the disruptive factor of humanity and satisfy it in a way that cannot interfere with building and maintaining the social relation. The proposition of the anti-sexist is to canalize the disruptive element. But this is the problem. Can this disruptive element really be thought of in terms of an element? That is, in terms of something that one can define, circumscribe, isolate? The answer seems to be no, and this is most evident in the way in which the basic operation of the anti-sexist immediately falls into two different operations, extracting, removing sex from the other, and exempting, removing the other from sex. Not much is said about how the first is done. The device basically provides the method of the second. It exempts the other from sexual pleasure, and the idea is, it would seem, that this automatically accomplishes the other task as well. It extracts, removes sex from the other, or produces a sexless other, ready to form spiritual bond with me. Since the sexual needs of the other are always perfectly satisfied, she or he becomes sexless. Sex is not a player in the relationship between people. This, of course, is a strange presupposition, to say the least. The other is sexless if he or she is being masturbated most of the time. Here we come to the very math theme of the anti-sexist device, which I propose to formulate as follows. To make oneself masturbated. To paraphrase the grammatical form used by Lacan in his conceptualization of the drive. In order to properly conceptualize the drive as something that escapes the active-passive opposition, Lacan proposes a formula that introduces something active at the very heart of passivity and vice versa. In the case of the scopic drive, for example, he dismantles what looks like reversals between seeing and being seen with the formulation making oneself seen. In this sense, the antisexist is its formula to make oneself masturbated could be said to provide the formula of the non-existent sexual drive. We saw how its task is actually twofold and twisted. In order to remove enjoyment from the other, one has to remove the other from enjoyment. This suggests, in fact, that enjoyment and the other are structured like matryoshka. Enjoyment is in the other. And when we look in the enjoyment, there is also the other in it, and so on. Enjoyment is in the other, and the other is in enjoyment. This is perhaps the most concise formulation of the structure of the non-relation, the non-relation between the subject and the other. If enjoyment is what disturbs this relation, it does so not simply by coming between them, and hence holding them apart, but rather by implicating, placing them one in the other. Let us take a moment here and look more closely at both sides of this configuration. What we have on the one hand is this. All enjoyment already presupposes the other, regardless of whether we get it with the help of the real other, another person, or not. This is Lacan's fundamental point. Even the most solitary enjoyment presupposes the structure of the other. This is also why the more we try to get rid of the other and become utterly self-dependent, the more we are bound to find something radically heterogeneous, other, 
at the very heart of our most intimate enjoyment. There is no enjoyment without the other because all enjoyment originates at the place of the other. As the locus of the signifiers, our innermost enjoyment can occur only at that extimate place. And this is not the same as saying that enjoyment is mediated by the other, or that we need the other in order to enjoy. It is of the utmost importance to grasp that the radical heterogeneity, incommensurability, and antagonism between the signifier and enjoyment is not due to their heterogeneous origins. For example, that one comes from the body and the other from the symbolic order. But, on the contrary to the fact that they originate at the same place. The other is both the locus of the signifier and the locus of enjoyment, mine as well as the enjoyment of the other. On the other hand, and as we saw in chapter 1, what we find, for example, at the very heart of the most sex-free spiritual Christian love is a proliferation of partial objects and their enjoyment. It is not pure enjoyment, enjoyment for the sake of enjoyment, that is being banned in this discourse. What is banned, or repressed, is the link between enjoyment and sexuality. But why exactly? Because this link exposes the non-relation at the very heart of every relation. Like all religions, Christianity presupposes and enforces the relation. The idea of a non-sexual, sexual enjoyment that we find here is actually the same as the one at work in the anti-sexist device. What is needed for the relation to exist is a sexless sex, or an otherless other, an other free of otherness. This, then, is the double paradox that we are trying to formulate. If we remove the other from enjoyment, we find the other at the very heart of the most autofocused masturbatory enjoyment. On the other hand, if we remove enjoyment from the other, we find enjoyment at the very heart of the most spiritual bond with the other. The other and enjoyment are extimately related. That is why, in order to remove enjoyment from the other, a second operation is immediately called for, that of removing the other from enjoyment. The two elements imply each other. Each carries the other in itself. And this is what twists what may look like a symmetry, or relation, in a way that resembles some of Escher's drawings of impossible objects. The Invisible hand job of the Market Lacan's point is that, since it is one with the discursive order, the non-relation is at work in all forms of social bond. It is not limited to the sphere of love. The latter is rather distinguished by the fact that in its field it actually happens from time to time and that the relation stops not being written. And his further point is that the social relations of power, domination, exploitation, discrimination, are first and foremost forms of exploitation of the non-relation. This is a delicate point, for it seems to contradict a point made earlier. Namely, that the most authoritarian social orders are those which aim at freeing the social from the non-relation. That is to say, social orders built in the name of the relation. Yet, this is not necessarily in contradiction with exploiting the non-relation. Perhaps we even find here a good way of distinguishing between the abolition of the non-relation as emancipatory project and what we may call narratives of the relation, which are actually in the service of the most vicious, social and economic, exploitation of the non-relation. Abolition of the non-relation has been, in fact, the way in which the authentic revolutionary projects of the 20th century often understood the path to radical emancipation. The catastrophic results of this kind of politics were inherent in the very honesty of the will to abolish the non-relation. The modus operandi of engineering a new order and a new man has been that of exposing the non-relation and attempting to force it out of the social equation by all possible means. And this is very different in its logic from what we may call the exploitation and segregation of people by presenting a given form of social antagonism, non-relation, as the ultimate relation, supposedly protecting us from the utter chaos of the non-relation, 
In this way, social injustice directly translates into a higher justice. At work here is not a crazy attempt to abolish the non-relation as the fundamental negativity, but disavowing it while at the same time appropriating it as the generic and productive point of social power. This is a truly political lesson of psychoanalysis. Power, and particularly modern forms of power, works first by appropriating a fundamental negativity of the symbolic order, its constitutive non-relation, while building it into a narrative of a higher relation. This is what constitutes, puts into place, and perpetuates the relations of domination. The actual concrete exploitation is based on, made possible, and fueled by this appropriation, this privatization of the negative. This is what distinguishes, to take the famous Brechtian example, the robbing of a bank, common theft, from the founding of a bank, a double theft, which appropriates the very lever of production and its exploitation. Nowhere is this more evident than in the case of capitalism, which starts off with two revolutionary ideas. The economic relation does not exist, and the non-relation could be very profitable. The first idea corresponds to the 18th century economists, led by Adam Smith, putting into question the previous mercantile doctrine and belief that the amount of the world's wealth remained constant, and that a nation could increase its wealth only at the expense of another nation. This is the image of a closed totality in which the relation ensures the visibility of the difference in wealth. If you want more, you have to take it from somewhere, so someone else has to lose. The relation is that of subordination, of the weak to the powerful but it is still a relation. The new economic idea undermines this totality-based relation while at the same time prizing the productivity of the newly discovered non-relation. The world's wealth can also increase by itself with the Industrial Revolution and the new organization of labor being the primary sources and carriers of this increase. I am deliberately putting this in the crudest and most simple terms so as to expose the most salient structural traits of this shift. What is the fundamental discovery of capitalism? That non-relation is profitable, that it is the ultimate source of growth and profit. And with this came the idea that, this being so, there is no reason why everybody couldn't profit from it. This is how we got the narrative of a new, higher relation, the foundational myth of modern capitalism known as the invisible hand of the market. Adam Smith's capital idea starts out from positing a social non-relation as a fundamental state also on another level. As elements of social order, individuals are driven by egotistic drives and the pursuit of self-interest. But out of these purely egotistic pursuits grows a society of an optimal general welfare and justice. It is precisely by ruthlessly pursuing one's own interest that one promotes the good of society as a whole, and much more efficiently so than when one sets off to promote it directly. As Smith put it in a famous quote from The Wealth of Nations, It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities but of their advantages. What is interesting about this idea in the context of our previous discussion is how it takes a first step in the right direction and then stops short. To put it in the terms we were using earlier, the idea is that what we find at the very core of the most selfish individual enjoyment is actually the other looking after a general welfare. What is missing is the next step. And what we find, at the same time, at the core of this other, is a most masturbatory self-enjoyment. Adam Smith's mistake is not that he saw the dimension of the other possibly at work in the most selfish pursuits of individual interests. All in all, this thesis is not simply wrong. We never do just what we think we are doing and what we intend to do. This is even a fundamental lesson of both height. Tango, tango, tango. This is even a fundamental lesson of both Hegel and Lacan. His mistake was that he did not follow this logic to the end. 
He failed to see where and how the other and its invisible hand also does not do only what they think they are doing. This is what becomes obvious with every economic crisis and became overwhelmingly clear with the last one. Left to itself, the market, other, is bound to discover solitary enjoyment. At some point in his comments on Platonov's anti-sexist, Schuster uses the expression, the invisible hand job of the market, which I am borrowing here, since one could hardly find a better way of putting what I am trying to articulate. The invisible hand of the market, supposedly looking after general welfare and justice, is always also, and already, the invisible hand job of the market, putting most of the wealth decidedly out of common reach. Adam Smith's idea could indeed be formulated in these terms. Let's make the non-relation work for everybody's profit. And one could hardly deny the fact that what we consider as wealth has increased in absolute and not only relative terms since the 18th century, or, as we often hear, that everybody, even the poorest, is living better than two centuries ago. Yet, the price of this modern economic higher relation is, again, that the differences between rich and poor are also exponentially greater, fed by the non-relation in its higher form. Why is the non-relation so productive and profitable? Marx saw it perfectly. In order for the non-relation to be economically productive and profitable, it has to be built into the very mode of production. He situated this at the precise structural point when labor appeared on the market as yet another commodity for sale. This is a key point in what he analyzes as the transformation of money into capital. To put it very simply, what makes the products, namely labor power, also appears with them on the market as one of the products. Objects for sale. This paradoxical redoubling corresponds to the point of structural negativity and its appropriation as the locus of the market's miraculous productivity. The money owner finds on the market a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value, and whose actual consumption is a creation of value. This is why it is too simple to say that what the capitalists have more of, they have stolen from the workers. This kind of claim still presupposes the old closed relation-based economy. What capital exploits is the point of negativity, entropy, of the social order with the workers situated at this precise point. Capitalists are not so much stealing from the workers as employing them to make the negativity, entropy, of the system work for them, the capitalists. Or, in other words, they are making themselves enriched. This, then, is what Marx recognized as the concrete structural point of the non-relation in capitalism, serving as the condition of its type of production and exploitation. Labor power as commodity is the point that marks the constitutive negativity gap of this system. The point where one thing immediately falls into another, use value into source of value. Labor is a product among other products, yet it is not exactly like other products. Where other products have a use value and hence a substance of value, this particular commodity leaps over or lapses to the source of value. The use value of this commodity is to be the source of value of other commodities. It has no substance of its own. This could also be put in a formula, the worker does not exist. What exists and must exist is the person whose work is sold and bought. This is why it is essential, according to Marx, that the person working does not sell himself his person. Converting himself from a free man to a slave from an owner of commodity into a commodity. He must constantly treat his labor power as his own property, his own commodity. This also shows how the usual humanist complaints about how in capitalism we are all just commodities misses the point. If we were indeed just commodities, capitalism would not work. We need to be free persons selling our labor power as our property, our commodity. The Marxian concept of the proletariat could be seen precisely as formulating the fact that, in capitalism, the worker doesn't exist. A worker that existed would actually be a slave. 
This is why the proletariat is not simply one of the social classes, but rather names the point of the concrete constitutive negativity in capitalism, the point of the non-relation obfuscated and exploited by it. The proletariat is not the sum of all workers. It is the concept that names the symptomatic point of this system, its disavowed and exploited negativity. And this general Marxian idea has lost none of its pertinence today. In conclusion, we can return to the invisible hand, its other side, and its criticism. Is it enough to claim that it does not exist, and to try to put it in its place a better, truly operative other? As a matter of fact, this is precisely the theoretical question that we see today emerging on the left. For example, with Thomas Piketty's work. Is it tenable to play one's cards on the side of distribution? In other words, is there a way in which we could make the non-relation-based profit really profitable for all? Is eliminate its handjob aspect, as it were? Can we maintain the profitable side of the non-relation while keeping its negative side under control by means of different social correctives and regulations concerning the distribution of wealth? <laughs>